Oh, hi, this is Ray Mosholter, and we're back to the man who shall become president on the 20th of January, Donald Trump. And he wrote a book. Oh, in fact, he's written several books. This one was written in the 80s, and it's a book called The Art of the Deal that everybody talks about because it is showing us so clearly how he makes decisions and what he does about choosing land, and we've just seen what he does about choosing cabinets. And I don't mean the kind that you put things in, but I'm talking about his administration. President Trump. Some offended by it, some, like me, happy as a clam, that is, providing that clams are happy. Have you ever seen one that wasn't? Huh? <laughs> Moving to Manhattan. I had my eye on Manhattan from the time I graduated from Wharton in 1968. But at that point, the market in the city was very hot. The prices seemed very high, and I was unable to find a deal that I liked meaning a good piece of property at a price I found affordable. My father had done very well for himself, but he didn't believe in giving his children huge trust funds. When I graduated from college, I had a net worth of perhaps $200,000, and most of it was tied up in buildings in Brooklyn and Queens. So I waited. I went to work helping to run my father's business, and I continue to spend as much time as possible in Manhattan. The turning point came in 1971, when I decided to rent a Manhattan apartment. It was a studio in a building on 3rd Avenue and 75th Street. Oh, and it looked out of the water tank <laughs> in the corner of the adjacent building. I jokingly referred to my apartment as a penthouse because it did happen to be near the top floor of the building. <laughs> I also tried to divide it up so that it would seem bigger. <laughs> but no matter what I did, it was still a dark, dingy little <laughs> apartment. And even so, I loved it. You know, moving into that apartment was probably more exciting for me than moving 15 years later into the top three floors of Trump Tower on 5th Avenue and 57th Street overlooking Central Park. Now, you got to understand, I was a kid from Queens who worked in Brooklyn, and suddenly I had an apartment on the Upper East Side. The really important thing was that by virtue of this move, I became very much more familiar with Manhattan. <clears throat> Excuse me. I began to walk the streets in a way you, you never do if you just come in to visit or do business. I got to know all the good properties. I became a city guy instead of a kid from the boroughs. As far as I was concerned, I had the best of all worlds. I was young, and I had a lot of energy, and I was living in Manhattan, even though I commuted back to Brooklyn to work. <laughs> One of the first things I did was to join La Club, which at the time was the hottest club in the city and perhaps the most exclusive, like Studio 54 at its site. It was located on East 54th Street, and its membership included some of the most successful men in the, and the most beautiful women in the world. It... Uh, was the sort of place where you were likely to see a wealthy 75-year-old guy walk in with three blondes from Sweden. I'll never forget how I became a member. One day I called up the club and I said, my name is Donald Trump and I'd like to join your club. And the guy on the other end of the phone just laughed. He said, you gotta be kidding. Nobody, of course, had heard of me. The next day I got another idea and I called back and I said to the guy, listen, could I have a list of your members? I may know someone who is a member. And he said, I'm sorry, we don't do that. And he hung up. 
The next day, I again called and said, I need to reach the president of the club. I want to send him something. And for some reason, the, the guy gave me the president's name and his business number. And I called him up. I introduced myself. I said very politely, my name is Donald Trump and I'd like to join the club. And he said, do you have any friends or family in the club? And I said, no, I don't know anybody there. He said, well, what makes you think that you should be admitted as a member? And I just kept talking and talking. Finally, this fellow said to me, I'll tell you what, you sound like a nice young man, and maybe it would be good to have some younger members, so why don't you meet me for a drink at 21? Well, the next night we met for a drink. There was still just one problem. I don't drink, and I'm not very big on sitting around. My host on the other end liked to drink, and it brought along a friend who also liked to drink, and for the next two hours... We sat there as they drank, and I didn't, until finally I said, listen, fellas, can I help you get home? And they said, no, let's just have one more. Now, I, ju I just was not used to that. I have a father who has always been a rock, very straight and very solid. My father would come home every night at 7, have his dinner, read the newspaper, watch the news, and that was that. And I'm as much of a rock as my father. This was a totally different world. I remember wondering if every successful person in Manhattan was a big drinker. I figured if that was the case, I was going to have a big advantage. Finally, about 10, these guys had had enough, and I practically had to carry them home. Two weeks passed, and I never heard from the president. Finally, I called him, and he didn't even remember who I was. So now I had to go through the whole thing all over again, back to 21, only this time he didn't drink as much. And he agreed to put me up for membership. He had only one misgiving. He said that because I was young and good-looking and because some of the older members of the club were married to beautiful young women, he was worried that I might be tempted to try to steal their wives. He asked me to promise that I wouldn't do that. You know, I, I, I couldn't believe what I was hearing. My mother is as much of a rock as my father. She's totally devoted to my father. They've recently celebrated 50 years of marriage. That's what I grew up with. And here's this guy talking about stealing wives. Anyway, I promised... I was admitted to the club, and it turned out to be a great move for me, socially and professionally. I met a lot of beautiful young single women, and I went out almost every night. Actually, I never got involved with any of them very seriously. There were These were beautiful women, but many of them couldn't carry on a normal conversation. Some were vain, some were crazy, some were wild. And many of them were phonies. For example, I quickly found out that I couldn't take these girls back to my apartment because by their standards, what I had was a disaster. And in their world appearances were everything. And when I finally did get married, I married a very beautiful woman, but a woman who also happens to be a rock, just like my mother and father. During that same period, I also met a lot of very successful, very wealthy men at Luck Club. Had a good time when I went out at night, but I was also working. I was learning how the New York scene operates, and I was meeting the sort of people with whom I'd eventually work on deals. I also met the sort of wealthy people, particularly Europeans and South Americans, who eventually bought the most expensive apartments in Trump Tower and Trump Plaza. It was at the club 
that I first met Roy Cohn. Now, I knew him by reputation and was aware of his image as a guy who wasn't afraid to fight. One night I was. I, one night I found myself sitting at the table next to him. We got introduced and we talked for a while and I challenged him. I like to test people. I said to him, I don't like lawyers. I think all they do is delay deals instead of making deals. And every answer they give you is no. And they're always looking to settle it instead of fight. He said he agreed with me. I liked that. So then I said, you know, I, I, I'm just not built that way. I'd rather fight than fold. Because as soon as you fold once, you get the reputation of being a folder. I could see that Roy was intrigued, but he wasn't sure what the point of it all was. Finally, he said, is this just an academic conversation? I said, no, it's, it's not academic at all. It so happens that the government has just filed suit against our company and many others under the Civil Rights Act, saying that we discriminated against blacks in some of our housing developments. I explained to him that I'd spent that afternoon with my father, talking to lawyers in a very prestigious Wall Street firm, and that they'd advised us to settle. That's exactly what most bus businessmen do when the government charges them with anything because they just don't want bad publicity, even if they believe they can beat a phony rap. The idea of settling drove me crazy. The fact was that we did rent to blacks in our buildings. We wanted tenants who we could be sure would pay the rent, who would be neat and clean and good neighbors, and who met our requirement of having an income at least four times the rent. So I said to Roy, what do you think I should do? And he said, my view is tell them to go to hell and fight the thing in court and let them prove that you discriminated, which seems to be very difficult to do in view of the fact that you have black tenants in the building. He also told me, I don't think you have any obligation to rent to tenants who would be undesirable, white or black. And the government doesn't have a right to run your business. You know, that's when I decided Roy Cohn was the right person to handle the case. I was nobody at the time. But he loved a good fight, and he took on my case. He went to court, and I went with him, and we fought the charges. And in the end, the government couldn't prove its case. And we ended up making a minor settlement without admitting any guilt. Instead, we agreed to do some equal opportunity advertising of vacancies for a period of time in the local newspaper. And that was the end of the suit. I learned a lot about Roy during that period. He was a great lawyer when he wanted to be. He could go into a case without any notes. He had a photographic memory, and he could argue the facts from his head. And when he was prepared, he was brilliant and almost unbeatable. However, he wasn't always prepared. Even then, he was so brilliant that he could sometimes get away with it. Unfortunately, it could also be a disaster, and so I would always question Roy very closely before a court date, and if he wasn't prepared, I'd push for a postponement. You know, I, I, I don't kid myself about Roy. He was no Boy Scout. He once told me he'd spent more than two-thirds of his adult life under indictment on one charge or another. And that amazed me. I said to him, Roy, just tell me one thing. Do you really do all that stuff? 
He looked at me and smiled. What the hell do you think? He said. I never really knew. Whatever else you could say about Roy, boy, he was tough. Sometimes I think that next to loyalty, toughness was the most important thing in the world to him. For example, all Roy's friends knew he was gay. And if you saw him socially, he was invariably was a very good-looking young man. Uh, Roy never talked about it. He just didn't like the image. He felt that to the average person, being gay was almost synonymous with being a wimp. That was the last thing he wanted to project, so he almost went overboard to avoid it. And if the subject of gay rights came up, Roy was always the first one to speak out against them. Tough as he was, Roy always had lots of friends. And I'm not embarrassed to say I was one. He was a truly loyal guy. It was a matter of honor with him. And because he was also very smart, he was a great guy to have on your side. You could count on him to go to bat for you even if he privately disagreed with your view. And even if defending you wasn't necessarily the best thing for him, he was never two-faced. Just compare that with all the hundreds of respectable guys who make careers that are boasting about their uncompromising integrity, but have absolutely no loyalty. They think only about what's best for them, and they don't think twice about stabbing a friend in the back if the friend becomes a problem. What I like most about Roy Cohn was that he would do just the opposite. Roy was a sort of guy who'd be there at your hospital bed long after everyone else had bailed out, literally standing by you to the death. In any case, I got to know a lot of people when I moved to Manhattan and I got to know properties, but I still couldn't find anything to buy at a price that I liked. Then suddenly, in 1973, things began to turn bad in Manhattan. You know, I'd always assumed the market would cool off because everything runs in cycles and real estate's no different. Even so, I never expected things to get as bad as they did. Oh, it was a combination of factors. First, the federal government announced a moratorium on housing subsidies, which they'd been giving out by the bushel, particularly in the city. And at the same time, interest rates began to rise after being so stable for so many years that it was easy to forget they could move at all. And then to make things worse, there was a spurt of inflation, particularly in construction costs, which seemed to rise even when there's no inflation anywhere else. But the biggest problem by far was with the city itself. The city's debt was rising to levels that started to make everyone very nervous. For the first time, you hear people talk about the city going bankrupt. Fear led to more fear. Before long, New York was suffering from a crisis of confidence. People simply stopped believing in the city. That wasn't an environment conducive to new real estate development in the first nine months of 1973. The city issued permits for about 15,000 new apartments and single-family homes in the five boroughs. In the first nine months of 1974, the number dropped from 15,000 to six. I worried about the future of New York City, too, but I, I can't say that it kept me up nights. Yeah, I, I'm basically an optimist. 
And frankly, I saw the city as trouble as a great opportunity for me. Because I grew up in Queens, I believed, perhaps to an irrational degree, that Manhattan was always going to be the best place to live, the center of the world. Whatever troubles the city might be having in the short term, there was no doubt in my mind that things had to turn around ultimately. What other city was going to take New York's place? One of the pieces of property that had always fascinated me was the huge abandoned rail yard along the Hudson River beginning at 59th Street and extending all the way up to 72nd Street. Every time I drove along the West Side Highway, I found myself dreaming about what could be built there. Didn't take a genius to realize that 100 acres of undeveloped riverfront property in Manhattan had a lot of potential. But it was another story to consider trying to develop such a huge piece of property when the city was in the midst of a financial crisis. You know, I don't believe that you can ever be hurt by buying a good location at a low price. At the time, a lot of neighborhoods on the west side were considered dangerous places to live. There were welfare hotels on every side street and drug dealers in every park. I remember the New York Times running a long series of articles about the block between Central Park West and Columbus Avenue at 84th Street. What a tough area it was. Even so, you, you didn't have to look very far to see how easily it could all change. Even on the tough side streets like West 84th, there were magnificent old brownstones only a few steps away from Central Park. And on the avenues, especially Central Park West and Riverside Drive, there were beautiful old buildings with huge apartments and spectacular views. It was only a matter of time before people discovered the value. One day in the summer of 1973, eh? came across a newspaper story about the Penn Central Railroad, which was in the middle of a massive bankruptcy filing. And this particular story said that the Penn Central trustees had hired a company headed by a man named Victor Palmieri to sell off the assets of the railroad. And among the assets, it turned out, were those abandoned yards in the West 60s, as well as more yards in the West 30s. The deal Victor made with the Penn Central was that each time that his company managed to find a buyer for an asset, he got a percentage of the sale. I had never heard of Victor Palmieri, but I realized immediately that he was someone I wanted to know I called his representatives and said, Hello, my name's Donald Trump, and I'd like to buy the 16th Street Yards. The simplest approach is often the most effective. I think they liked my directness and my enthusiasm. I hadn't built anything yet, but what I did have was the willingness to go after things that people in a better position than mine wouldn't have considered seeking. I went to meet Victor and we got on very well right from the start. He was a very smooth, attractive guy, an Italian who looked like a wasp. I told him how bad the 60th Street Yards were, that the neighborhood was in trouble and the city was in trouble, and that I was probably crazy to be interested in the property at all. If you want to buy something, it's obviously in your best interest to convince the seller that what he's got isn't worth very much. 
the second thing I told Victor was how incredibly hard it was going to be to politically get zoning approvals for such a big piece of undeveloped land. I pointed out that the community board would fight any development and that the process of going before the city planning commission and the board of estimate would be endless. The third thing I did, probably most important, was to sell myself to Victor and his people. I couldn't sell him on my experience <laughs> or my accomplishment. So instead I sold him on my energy and my enthusiasm. Victor banks on people and he decided to take a shot on me. He ended up suggesting that I develop not only the 60th Street Yards, but also the yards on West 34th Street. And in truth, I probably oversold myself to him. I had no other choice. I was 27 years old at the time, and I, I had never built anything in Manhattan, nor had my father. Much as Victor liked me, I don't think he could have justified going with me if he hadn't believed our company was big and powerful. <laughs> we had no formal name for the company when I met Victor. So I began to call it the Trump Organization. And somehow the word organization made it sound much bigger. Few people knew that the Trump Organization operated out of a couple of tiny offices on Avenue Z in Brooklyn. The other thing I promoted was our relationship with politicians, such as Abraham Beam, who was elected mayor of New York in November of 1973. My father did belong to the same Democratic club that Abe Beam came out of, and they did know each other. Like all developers, my father and I contributed money to Beam and to other politicians. The simple fact is that contributing money to politicians is very standard and accepted for a New York City developer. We didn't give any more to Beam than a lot of other developers did. In fact, it often seemed to me that perhaps because we knew Beam personally, he almost went out of his way to avoid any appearance that he was doing us any special favors. Instead, I spent most of the four years when Beam was mayor trying to promote the West 34th Street site for a convention center. It was by far the best site on the merits, and we eventually got nearly every big name New York City businessman behind us. And still Beam never came out in support of the site until a few weeks before he left office. Nor did he ever give it his official approval. It was Ed Koch, newly elected in 1978, who finally chose our site for the convention center. No one, so far as I know, has ever suggested that Donald Trump and Ed Koch are close personal friends. But that's getting well ahead of the story. By building a close relationship with Victor from the start, I was able, in effect, to work for him rather than, than just be another buyer. That was terrific for me. For example, we drew up agreements giving me an exclusive option to purchase the 60th Street and 30th Street yards, but subject to zoning, subject to approval by the court, handling the Penn Central bankruptcy, subject to everything except my having to put up any money. The Penn Central even agreed to pay my development costs. It was remarkable in a way. <laughs> 
the seller paying for the costs of the potential buyer. Still, you have to put it into perspective. What sounds like a stupid deal today was very different at a time when no one wanted to build anything in the city was dying. Paul Murray, in turn, helped give me credibility with the press. When he was asked by a reporter from Barron's why he chose Trump over others, he said, quote, those properties were nothing but a black hole of undefinable risk. We interviewed all kinds of people who were interested in them, none of whom had what seemed like the kind of drive, the backing, the imagination that would be necessary. Till this young guy Trump came along. He's almost a throwback to the 19th century as a promoter. He's larger than life. At one point, when I was hyping my plans to the press, but in reality getting nowhere, a big New York real estate guy told one of my close friends, Trump has a great line of expletive deleted, but when I heard that, and I didn't speak to this guy for more than a year. I was outraged. He said, "It's a great line of expletive deleted, but where are the bricks and the mortar? As I say, I didn't speak to this guy for more than a year. But, you know, looking back, I can see he was right. It could have all gone up in smoke if I had managed to make one of those first projects happen, if I hadn't finally convinced the city to choose my West 34th Street site for its convention center and then gone on to develop the Grand Hyatt, well, I'd probably be back in Brooklyn today collecting rents. I had a lot riding on those first projects. On July 29th, 1974, we announced that the Trump Organization had secured options to purchase the two waterfront sites from the Penn Central, West 59th Street to West 72nd Street, and West 34th Street to West 39th Street at a cost of $62 million with no money down. The story made the front page of the New York Times. Now my original idea was to build middle income housing on the sites at rents that seem ridiculously cheap today, 110 to $125 a room but were considered moderately high at that time. I planned to seek financing from the Mitchell Lama program through which the city provided low interest, long-term mortgages and tax abasements to builders. The program had been initiated to encourage middle-income housing. The month before our announcement, Victor and I and some of his people met with Abe Beam to sound him out about our development plans. Although he was encouraging from the moment we went public, he refused to take any position until our plan had been considered by city agencies, including the City Planning Commission, the Board of Estimate, and the local community boards. He was a politician and he wanted to see which way the winds were blowing before he took a stand. No sooner had I announced my plans publicly than other bidders for the rail yards suddenly came out of the woodwork. Starrett Housing, for example, a company we were partners with on the Starrett City Housing Project in Brooklyn, made a bid of 150 million dollars. Contingent 
on financing and city approvals and all the rest. Well, on the face of it, their bid was a lot higher than mine. I'm the first to admit that I'm very competitive and that I'd do nearly anything within legal bounds to win. Sometimes part of making a deal is denigrating your competition. In this case, I happen to genuinely believe that the Starrett bid wasn't legitimate, that the company would never close the deal and would not be able to successfully develop the site even if the deal did go through. Well, the fact is that anyone can bid anything, I mean, particularly when there are all sorts of contingencies. The same thing could be said about my bid, except that by then I'd put in enough time and effort to have convinced Paul Murray's people that I was very serious and I was very committed. In the end, I managed to convince Paul Murray that it made more sense to stick with my $62 million than to take a flyer on start. The irony is that less than a year after I announced my plans for the site and beat my competition, the economic situation in New York turned from bad to much worse. In February 1975, the Urban Development Corporation, the state agency that sold bonds to finance public housing, defaulted on more than $100 million of repayment on its bonds. In September 1975, Beam announced that because of the fiscal crisis, the city was suspending its own plans to finance the construction of virtually all new housing. In November 1975, the state announced that it too was suspending any financing of lower and middle income housing for the next five years, including a huge number of city projects that had already received preliminary approval. I couldn't get up in the morning without running across some new headline about the city's fiscal crisis. I can't say that any of this made me truly fearful about the city's future. Still, when it became clear that I wasn't going to get any subsidies to build housing, I decided to try a new tack. You know, I'd, I'd always thought that the West 34th Street site would be perfect for a new convention center. The problem was that nearly everyone else had other ideas. For starters, the city, with the support of many prominent local businessmen, had already spent more than three years studying and trying to develop another site by the Hudson River at 44th Street. And in the planning process alone, the city acknowledged $13 million had been spent, but people I knew told me that the number was actually closer to $30 million. And that just weeks after the city said it wouldn't finance any new housing. Beam announced that the city was also freezing further spending on development of the 44th Street location. Well, I immediately hired Samuel H. Lindenbaum, a talented attorney who specialized in zoning and who had been working until then on the 44th Street site. The other person I hired to help with the convention center was a highly dedicated woman named Louise Sunshine, who had extraordinary political connections. Louise had been the finance director for Hugh Carey when he ran for governor in 1974. She was also treasurer of the state Democratic Party. And at first she worked for me for practically no pay. In 
Later, she became an executive in our company. But even as I was assembling a team to promote my site, the city and state were hatching their own alternative to put the convention center in Battery Park City, opposite the World Trade Center in southern Manhattan. In my opinion, both sites, West 44th Street and Battery Park, were terrible choices. Making my case was another matter. I wanted to wage the battle in public, but I was an unknown. I mean, if I was going to attract attention for my site and win support for it, I had to raise my profile. I decided to call my first news conference. Louise and Howard Rubenstein, a major New York public relations executive, helped attract support from several powerful people, including Manfred Orenstein, the majority leader of the state senate, and Theodore Keel, the labor negotiator, who was very powerful in New York politics. Keel delivered a classic line at the press conference. Placing the new convention center in Battery Park is like putting a nightclub in a graveyard. For our part, we put up a huge banner that said, Miracle on 34th Street. And I announced before a ton of reporters that I could build my convention center for $110 million dollars, or at least $150 million less than the city had estimated it would cost to build at West 44th Street. And not surprisingly, that raised some eyebrows and even got us some press attention. But there was scarcely an approving peep from the politicians. I discovered for the first time, but not the last, that politicians don't care too much what things cost. It's not their money. In promoting my site, the first thing I pointed out wherever I went was how important it was to build the convention center. A lot of people were saying that the best solution in light of the city's fiscal crisis was to scrap the idea altogether. To me, that was classic short-sightedness. For example, in the face of sales drop, most companies cut back on their advertising budgets. But in fact, you need advertising the most when people aren't buying. Essentially, that's what I said about at conventions that are Building what I argued was critical to reviving the city's image and ultimately to putting its economy back on track. I also told anyone who would listen how great my site was and how horrible the alternatives were. I pointed out that 44th Street, the convention center, would have to be built on platforms over the water which would be more costly, more problematic, and ultimately more time-consuming. I said that the 44th Street site was too small, that there was no room to expand it, and that because it was on the water, you'd have to cross under the crumbling West Side Highway to get to it. Finally, I made a big deal out of the fact that you needed something called a non-navigable permit to build on the 44th Street site. A non-navigable permit, which I became an expert about very quickly, is the federal approval required to build on certain waterways, and getting it requires an act of Congress. Now, I was just as rough on the Battery Park site, which was an even more ridiculous location at the absolute southern tip of the city. I pointed out how remote it was 
from Midtown. How far from hotels and entertainment and how inconvenient to public transportation. And I also circulated a state study which concluded that building a convention center at Battery Park would require major reconstruction of the West Side Highway leading to it, as well as the addition of at least 2,000 new hotel rooms. And most of all, I talked about what a wonderful location I had on West 34th Street. It was on the right side of the highway, the eastern side, which meant it was easily accessible. It was closer to subways and buses than the alternative sites. I continue to make the case that the center could be built more cheaply on my site without dispossessing any tenants. And also because my site was so big, there was plenty of room for expansion in the future. When a group of graduate students in a class taught by City Councilman Robert Wagner did a little study that rated our site the best, I managed to get a hold of it and immediately christened it the Wagner Report. It's a namesake wasn't thrilled. Before long, I had everything going for me except the support of a few absolutely key people. Abe Beam was on the top of the list. And once he gave up on West 44th Street, Beam got behind Battery Park, and no matter how many great arguments I came up with for my side, he wouldn't budge. And another major opponent was John Zuccotti, a deputy mayor under Beam. He began going around the town bad-mouthing my site. The reason I'm convinced was that he didn't want to admit that he'd wasted several years of his life and millions of dollars of public money on a location that never made sense in the first place. And that's exactly what I said publicly. I accused him of being self-serving and petty and a half dozen other things. He got pretty riled up. The battle received a lot of media attention and ultimately I think it was good for my site. It became just another way to promote my site's many advantages. And in the end, we won by wearing everyone else down. We never gave up, and the opposition slowly began to melt away. In 1977, Beam appointed yet another committee to study the alternative sites, and it concluded that we did have the best site. And on that basis, Beam finally gave us his support, although not his signature. And on that basis, he was just leaving office at the end of the year. In January of 1978, Ed Koch took over as mayor and decided to do his own study. I figured we were back to square one. But things moved fast, and once again our site came out ahead. And finally, in April 1978, the city and state announced that they had decided to purchase the 34th Street site and build the convention center there. <laughs> it was a victory for me, but more symbolically than financially. For all the time I'd invested, I earned much less than I deserved and nowhere near enough to justify the effort financially. As my deal with the Penn Central was structured, I was paid total compensation of about $833,000 based on the $12 billion price 
for the site that the city negotiated with Penn Central. In the end, I offered to forgo my fee altogether. If the city would agree to name the convention center after my family. You know, I, I, I've been criticized for trying to make that trade, but I have no apologies. There wouldn't be a new convention center in New York today if it hadn't been for the Trumps. More important, the city would have saved a fortune by letting me build the center, which I very much wanted to do. Instead, Ed Koch decided by some logic that I could never understand that because I'd helped arrange the sale of the property, it was a conflict for me to be the builder as well. And eventually, I offered the city a deal that frankly was ridiculous for me. I said I would bring the entire job in for less than two hundred million dollars. And if there were any overruns, I'd pay for them myself. Now you won't find many builders willing to put themselves on the line that way. Instead, the city and state decided to oversee the job. And the result was perhaps the most horrendous construction delays and cost overruns in the history of the building business. A man named Richard Kahan was put in charge of the Urban Development Corporation, and ultimately it was his job to oversee the Convention Center project. Now, Richard Kahan is a nice man, but he had visions of being the next Robert Moses. It wasn't clear that he had the experience or the talent. One of the first things Kahan did was to hire I.M. Pei as his architect. I.M. Pei is a man with a terrific reputation, but in my view, he often chooses the most expensive solution to a problem and is virtually uncontrollable. Immediately, Pei decided to design a space frame for the center, a structural system that any professional builder will tell you is one of the most difficult to build and especially vulnerable to cost overruns. And this is particularly true when you're dealing with the sort of huge space frame they needed for a convention center. From the very start, I told Kahan and his people that it was critical to build a parking garage simultaneously. I, I come on, how can you have a convention center without parking? They told me that a garage would hold up the city's environmental impact approval. Look, I said to them, those approvals are only going to be tougher to get later. And at the very least, you should begin a separate filing for the garage now so you can at least start the process. They ignored me, and now they have no parking and no prospect of building any in the near future. The choice of where to put the entrance was equally ill-considered. If you put the entrance at the west, the whole center faces the Hudson River, which is a beautiful view. Instead, they built the entrance on the eastern side of the building, facing the traffic on 11th Avenue. And as I watched all these mistakes being made, I became very angry and extremely frustrated. And in 1983, when it was clear the construction of the convention center was already a disaster of delays and overruns. I wrote a letter to William Stern, who by then had replaced Richard Kahan as president of the Urban Development Corporation. 
for a second time I offered, this time for no fee at all, to oversee the project and to assure that it would get completed quickly and without further cost overruns. My offer was refused, and a disaster eventually turned into a catastrophe. And by the time the convention center was finally finished last year, it was four years behind schedule and at least $250 million over budget. When you add interest by carrying costs for all those years of construction, the total cost was probably $1 billion or $700 million over budget. The, the, the construction was a terrible disgrace and all the worse because no one raised a fuss about it. When I was invited to attend opening day ceremonies in 1986, I refused. What happened to the convention center? It's a, the city in this state took a great piece of property and a great project and ruined it through terrible planning and ridiculous cost overruns. Even if the convention center is ultimately a success, it can never earn back all the money that was unnecessarily squandered to build it. And the funny thing about devoting so much time and energy to the 34th Street site is that I never considered it anything to compare with the 60th Street Yards. The problem was that developing 60th Street proved even more difficult than promoting 34th Street. The community opposition was stronger, the zoning was more complicated, and the banks were highly reluctant to finance a huge residential housing project in a city still teetering on the verge of bankruptcy. In 1979, I reluctantly let my option on the 60th Street Yards expire so that I could concentrate on other deals that seemed more immediately promising. The first one, fittingly, was with Palmieri and the Penn Central for the purchase of the Commodore Hotel. I don't know about you, but every time, that's the end of the chapter, every time that I read another chapter of his book, I can see him in action now. I can understand the last year of his campaign, both uh, during the primaries and in the general election. I can see it. I hope you do too. And uh, we'll be going on with Chapter 6, The Grand Hotel Reviving 42nd Street in our next edition. How many? Five days from now.